I spoke three weeks ago, I think it was, on no man cared for my soul. Um, we don't have to have evangelism. My funny once uh, a year, strictly speaking, uh, evangelism is an everyday thing. We just like to have a focus on it in one month because um, no man cared for my soul, part two. So we saw that while David was hiding in a cave from his enemies, he cries in despair that no man cared for my soul. Psalm 142 verse 4, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would acknowledge me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. But we find that Jesus said that he had come to give rest to those who were weary and burdened and Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus has promised those of us who feel that no one cares for our soul, that he will give us rest for the soul. And so if you're weary and burdened today, to those who respond to his call, come to me. Jesus still offers rest for the weary and the burdened soul. But sometimes, especially when people have been saved a long time, we become like Jonah and we forget God's grace, the same grace he showed to us. And we're angry when God saves people that we think should be destroyed, forgetting that we too deserve that same fate. And we become like Jonah, who, as I've said before, was the only preacher I know who was angry when he had a revival, okay, because God was saving the wrong people. And he tells God, you know, exactly this. And this is why I ran away. I knew you were going to do this. Okay. Is this not when I said what I, I was still at home? This, that is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. He was angry that God didn't destroy the city, the city of thousands, because they were the enemies of Israel and were not worthy of forgiveness in his opinion. And we see the same sort of spirit with James and John. When Jesus refused entry or passage through a Samaritan village, and remember the Samaritans and the Jews, there was no lo love lost between them. And so when these Samaritans won't let Jesus go through there, they say to Jesus, let's call down fire, let's burn up their village. And Jesus, we know, rebuked them. And he said to them, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And yet we often have that same spirit, the spirit of Jonah, where we would rather not obey God's calling because we'd prefer that God destroy sinners. Or like James and John, we'd rather God send down fire and burn up a city than that we actually go preach there and they repent. And the reason some folk don't believe in evangelism or missions is that the brand of, propag uh, of Christianity they have isn't worth propagating. And so it's only a nominal Christian. And by that, I mean someone who's a Christian superficially on the surface. They have no passion for the lost. So I hope that you have a passion for the lost. Now, have you ever wondered why the church was still in the world? We, in this wicked world, why didn't, you know, Jesus just, take the church back to heaven? Or why is he seeming to be lingering? Is it because he wants us to have fellowship here? Well, surely the fellowship we'd have in the presence of God would be even better. Was it because of the nice worship we have? And we do have nice worship here, but surely in heaven the worship would be even better. And the reason we were left behind was for evangelization, because the job is not finished. We are here to be instrumental in Jesus searching for lost sheep. We are his hands, his feet, and his mouthpiece in the world. Remember, Jesus is no longer physically in this world. Jesus is a man, 
can only be one place at a time and he's seated at the right hand of the father but he is present with us through virtue of the holy spirit and that's why he promised that he would send his holy spirit and through the holy spirit we are his mouthpiece in this world and if we're not doing that we've forgotten the purpose that we were left here evangelism was important to jesus he had a forerunner john the baptist who was an evangelist his message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand he wanted sinners to turn to god and he himself was an evangelist because the start of his ministry it says he began to preach repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near and he called men to follow him who he would train as evangelists he even said i'll make you fishers of men that's an evangelist someone instead of catching fish like they used to do would catch men for the kingdom of god and he commanded not only his immediate disciples but all of us to be evangelists therefore go and make disciples of all nations now it's true some people are more gifted in that area but each and every one of us has a personal testimony and that commandment applies to us to share with others the good news of the gospel of the kingdom so last time if you recall if you can remember that far back hopefully your memory can go back three weeks we looked at three parables that jesus told and he did it in response to the pharisees criticizing him because he was hanging around with the wrong people instead of hanging around with the nice religious people like them he was hanging around with sinners and prostitutes and tax collectors cheats um, and jesus in response told them the story about the lost sheep the lost coin and the lost son and in each case there's someone who's searching for something that is lost but it's considered very valuable by them and we know that those parables reveal that jesus himself was that person who was searching searching for what was lost something he considered valuable actively seeking them rejoicing when they're found in each one of those stories when uh, what is lost is found there's a party thrown and friends are called to come and celebrate and jesus said that was typical typical of what the angels do when a single sinner who's lost is found and so he taught us that the kingdom of god is accessible to all even those who sinners who've strayed from god's path so you haven't strayed too far to remember like the prodigal son that you have a father's house should be familiar with dl moody i quote him quite a lot famous evangelist from the 19th century that's not him <laughs> that's ira sankey what work are you in the man ask, asking the question had just introduced himself to Ira B. Sankey as Dwight L. Moody. Sankey replied that he worked for the Internal Revenue Service. So in other words, he was a tax collector. <laughs> well, you'll just have to give it up, said Moody. Sankey was in Chicago to attend a convention. He had heard of D.L. Moody's evangelistic work and wanted to see the great soul winner for himself. During the service, Moody asked someone to select a song. Sankey started to sing Cooper's hymn, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. The crowd enthusiastically picked up the tune. I've been praying eight years for someone like you, Moody told him. Sankey wasn't so sure about this. Imagine being prayed out of one job into another. But several months later, Sankey joined Moody. Moody preached and Sankey sang. Between them, they led hundreds of thousands to commit their lives to Christ. As a team, Moody was a great believer in the power of music for the gospel. And so he and Sankey popularized many songs that produced a, a hymn book as well with all the modern songs at that time anyway. It didn't turn out that way, however. Shortly after Sankey joined Moody, the great Chicago fire broke out. Sankey helped fight the flames, was nearly trapped, and barely escaped in front of them. He made his way to Lake Michigan and put offshore in a rowboat. The boat's line broke, and the singer was blown away from shore. Only with desperate effort and much prayer was he able to work his way back to dry land. 
When Moody and Sankey rejoined forces, they toured Britain. Sankey saw a poem he liked in a Scottish newspaper, tore it out and read it to Moody. Moody didn't seem interested, so Sankey tucked it into his pocket. When Moody asked for a closing hymn the next evening, the Holy Spirit prompted Sankey to use the poem in his pocket. Although he had composed no music for it, he pulled it out and made up the melody on the spot, half singing and half speaking the words. It was on this day, May the 21st, 1874, that the world first heard the 90 and 9, a song based on Jesus' parable of the lost sheep. Response was overwhelming. Moody himself came down afterwards with tears in his eyes and asked where Sankey had found the wonderful song, the song about Jesus' parable. Elizabeth Clefane wrote the words, but died before she knew how God had used them. And so let me just read these words of this poem that were put to music by Sankey, one of the many hymns that they used in the evangelism campaign. There were 90 and 9 that safely lay in the shelter of the fold. But one was out in the hills away, far off from the gates of gold, away on the mountains, wild and bare, away from the tender shepherd's care. Lord, thou hast thy ninety and nine, are they not enough for thee? But the shepherd made answer, this of mine has wandered away from me. And although the road be rough and steep, I go to the desert to find my sheep. But none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through, ere he found his sheep that was lost. Far out in the desert he heard its cry, to a sick and helpless and ready to die. Lord, whence are those blood drops all the way that mark out the mountain's track? They were shed for one who had gone astray, ere the shepherd could bring him back. Lord, whence are thy hands so rent and torn? They pierced tonight by many a thorn. And all through the mountains, thunder riven, and up from the rocky steep, there rose a glad cry to the gate of heaven, Rejoice, I found my sheep. And the angels echoed around the throne, Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. Beautiful story of Jesus searching for the lost sheep. And that lost sheep was once you, was once me, and it's now those who haven't yet received the gospel. Or we have wandered away from the shepherd. Because at the core, we're all sheep. Sheep naturally drift away from the flock and they end up in strange places. And they don't know how to get back. And so in Isaiah 53 verse 6, the prophet writes, all we like sheep have gone, gone astray. All of us have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This great um, chapter that was prophetic of the coming suffering servant of Jesus, uh, of, of the Lord, who is, would be Jesus, said that the Lord would lay on him the iniquity of all our sheep who have gone astray. And so, just like that sheep that wanders away and gets lost, people, including us, naturally drift away and stray off from the shepherd. And Jesus shows the shepherd taking the initiative. He has the compassion to go search for the lost sheep. And so during his ministry on earth, often Jesus would actively seek out a single lost sheep. He wasn't just interested in speaking to the crowds, which he did as well. But there were times when he purposely uh, went to a particular place and his intention was to find a single lost sheep. And the classic example of this is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, was he a man that you'd particularly want to be in your church? He was a known swindler. He made his fortune by cheating others. He was rich, but he was rich at the expense of others. He was a crook, corrupt politician. <laughs> and he's trying to check out Jesus while remaining inconspicuous. But Jesus stops at the tree where he's climbed, and calls him down. You know the story. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And he's criticized again by those who know Zacchaeus' reputation. And they say he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Look, he's doing it again, fraternizing with 
corrupt government officials. And Jesus, after spending time, short time with Zacchaeus, we see the change of heart in this man. And he says, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. If I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Ken was sharing yesterday in the devotional about restitution. And that is what Zacchaeus does. He not only repents, he makes restitution, which is very important. And Jesus sees that as a sign of his repentance. Jesus had just found another lost son. And he said, today salvation has come to this house. Because this man, this corrupt cheat, is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost, the lost sheep. So Jesus not only those, they told those stories, he put them into practice. He has another lost sheep that Jesus made a point of going to find. He made a special boat trip. And there was only one convert on that mission, one convert. He was actually turned away by the rest of the people in that region. And the lost sheep he was looking for was a violent, demon-possessed man who rented like a lunatic. He lived naked. He ran around naked, harassing people and giving them a hard time, mutilating his body with stones. And yet Jesus made that special trip for this lost sheep. He has a lost daughter that he, uh, that he found. He goes through, uh, through a potentially hostile town. Remember how he was received at that other Samaritan town? They wouldn't even let him through. Well, yeah, he goes to another Samaritan town, hostile territory, to find his lost daughter. She was a racist, okay, and a serial divorcee who was shacking up with her latest in a long line of lovers. Okay, and uh, Jesus goes to find her. Why are you talking to me? You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. You know, don't you know we don't talk to each other? And yet Jesus reaches out to his lost sheep. We see him having mercy on the adulteress, another lost sheep, when the others were quite happy to put her to death for her sin. Jesus extended mercy to her and said, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. He not only rescues her from her accusers, he himself pardons her. He defends a prostitute who offers an act of worship, another lost sheep. And he says to the self-righteous Pharisee, Simon, who's criticizing him in his thoughts, he says, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. So there's nothing you can do that can put you outside the reach of Jesus' love, we see. And like their master, as he trained them, the apostles who once were men who wanted to call down fire on villages who didn't receive the message, they became passionate about men's souls. And so when they brought before this court, the very court that condemned Jesus to death, and they command them, you better stop, you know, teaching in his name, else you know what's going to happen to you. And what is their reply? We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. They had passion for souls. And the Apostle Paul had passion for souls. He says in 1 Corinthians 9.22, to the weak, I become weak, to win the weak. I've become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. He actually says that he was compelled to preach the gospel. He said, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. It's not a choice, Paul says. You know, he has this passion. He had a passion for his own people. He said in Romans 10 verse 1, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. In fact, he actually says that he would, like Moses, very similar, that he would be willing to be cursed himself if his people could be saved, that he would be prepared to be damned. He said, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel, showing his love for his people. 
wishing that they could be saved. Passion for souls. God sends his evangelist, Philip, to meet a single individual who had already left Jerusalem. This man from Africa, from Ethiopia, visited Jerusalem, and yet it appears that he didn't find what he was searching for. He was going back, reading the scriptures, not understanding them, and we see that the Lord says to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Kandaki, which means queen of the Ethiopians. And he asks him, do you understand what you're reading? And the response of the Ethiopian eunuch is, well, how can I, unless someone explains it to me? And he climbs up onto the chariot with him, explains the way of the gospel, and this lost sheep responds. And we know how he sees water, wants to be baptized. And after Philip explains the gospel to him, he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and he is baptized and goes on his way rejoicing. Another lost sheep is found. John Patton, who was a missionary to the South Sea Islands, said, I continually heard the wail of the perishing heathen in the South Seas. He was compelled to go because he said he heard their cry. James Corkey, Methodist minister and evangelist in the United States, England, and Canada, said, oh, to burn out for God, all, all for him, Jesus only, souls, souls, souls. I'm determined to be a winner for souls. God help me. Do we have that passion? William Chalmers Burns, missionary to China, I'm ready to burn out for God. I'm ready to endure any hardship if by any means I might save some. The longing of my heart is to make known my glorious Redeemer to those who have never heard. Is that our prayer? Charles Kalman, he was the founder of OMS International. And he lived for just one thing, to win souls for Christ. As he wrote to the millions of Japan, he resolved by the help of God, they shall hear if it costs every drop of my life's blood. Here I am, Lord, send me, he says, echoing Isaiah's word. Send me. It was said of him, the winning of a soul was to him what the winning of a battle is to a soldier, what the winning of a bride is to a lover, what the winning of a race is to an athlete. And in that he emulated his master, who, like the shepherd, went to search for the one lost sheep. And so we're told in 1 Peter 3, verse 15, you should be familiar with this passage now. You've heard it many times. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. If anyone asks you, it says always be prepared to give them an answer to, uh, for the reason, uh, for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So we need to firstly set Christ, um, set, uh, in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. And always to remember that it's done with gentleness and respect. We need to keep a clear conscience. D.L. Moody said, it is the greatest pleasure of living to win souls to Christ. I look upon this world as a wrecked vessel. God has given me a lifeboat and said, Moody, save all you can. In the sermon, Why God Used D.L. Moody, R.A. Torrey, he was the one who succeeded Moody at the, at the church he founded in Chicago. He cited one of the reasons that uh, that God used Moody so powerfully was Moody's consuming passion for the salvation of the lost. D.L. Moody said in Proverbs we read, he that wins souls is wise. If any man, woman or child by a godly life and example can win one soul to God, his life will not have been a failure. He will have outshone all the mighty men of his day because he will have set a stream in motion 
that will flow on and on forever and ever if you lead just one soul to Christ. He also said, if you do not feel a fervent love and profound pity for humanity, be assured that the gift of Christian eloquence has been denied you. You will not win souls. Neither will you acquire that most excellent of earthly sovereignties, sovereignty over human hearts. Love is irresistible. If we do not commend the gospel to people by our holy walk and conversation, we shall not win them to Christ. Some little act of kindness will perhaps do more to influence them than any number of long sermons. Sermons are necessary. Talking is necessary, but it's also necessary to back it up with your life. Peter Billhorn was another Christian musician who worked with Moody. Uh, he was also an evangelist, and he relates the following about the time that he spent with Moody when he was holding meetings in Buffalo in New York State. I'll read this to you. One stormy Monday morning, after reading and prayer, I ventured to ask him, that's the Moody, wherein his power lay. It seemed that every man with whom he spoke on the subject of salvation and becoming a Christian was swept right into the kingdom. Oh, how I craved the, this blessing and power. He said, Bill on, I'll tell you this much. I made a promise to God and the rule of my life that I would speak to at least one man every day about his soul salvation. I said, but Mr. Moody, the opportunity does not always present itself. He quickly replied and said, it will, if you keep in touch with God and keep your eyes open for the opportunity. I was anxious to see just how he approached men on the subject of salvation, as it is not always as easy, an easy task. So watching closely from morning till evening, I was sure that no one had called their rainy day to see him. Bill Horn relates that in the evening, a fierce storm broke out and they had to request a carriage to take them there. That's to the meeting they were going to. Water was running down the streets like a river and almost reached the stepping board. Every few minutes, he would open the door and stick his head out in the storm. The night was pitch dark. The rain was beating against the carriage. I was puzzled at the seeming peculiarity of his sticking his head out in the storm but I'd learned not to question him about it. And soon I learned the reason. He called to the driver to stop, which he did. And Mr. Moody stepped out of the carriage into the rain and stood there a moment. Soon a man came along, pushing his way against the storm with an umbrella. Mr. Moody stopped him and said, where are you going? I'm going to the opera house to hear Moody preach. So am I. Step in and ride. He literally lifted the man in. Hardly had the man seated himself when Mr. Moody said to him, are you a Christian? No, I'm not. Would you like to be? Was his next question. The man shaking the water from his hat and collar said, you don't think I'd be coming out in this storm to hear Moody preach if I wasn't thinking that way, would you? Then Mr. Moody said to me, Bill Horn, you pray for this man. Oh, yes, I prayed, but to me it didn't seem much of a prayer. Then Mr. Moody prayed, and just at this moment, the storm was spending its fury, and amidst the thunder and lightning, his voice could be heard, O oh God, save this brother tonight, right here, now, for Christ's sake. Amen. The storm which had so furiously been raging ceased, and there seemed to be a sweet calm, as Mr. Moody said, Bill Horn, will you take Jesus Christ, I'm oh, sorry, brother, will you take Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? The man, still dripping with water, said, yes, yes, I do, I do. Just then the carriage came to a stop at the door of the opera house. Mr. Moody stepped out and said, Bill Horn, you give the man a seat down in the front, which I did. When the preaching was over, Mr. Moody asked all those who were Christians to stand. The man in question also rose. Mr. Moody pointed at him and said, are you a Christian? With a shout, the man replied, I was saved in a carriage tonight, come in here. A man prayed for me. I guess that was you, mister. And it was. He had kept his vow and pledge to God that he would at least speak to one man each day about his soul salvation. Thus I learned one reason wherein lay the remarkable spiritual power of that man of God, D.L. Moody. Once when he was walking down the street in Chicago, he stepped up to a perfect stranger and he said, Sir, are you a Christian? 
you mind your own business, was the reply. And Moody replied, this is my business. <laughs> the man said, well, then you must be Moody. He had a reputation. But maybe you don't want to be as pushy as Moody. We don't all necessarily have the outgoing nature of Moody that we can do that, surely. Jesus told a parable about a wedding banquet. And in the wedding banquet, the master, uh, the ruler, the king who's preparing the banquet, after he gets turned down by all the invited guests, he says to his servants, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be uh, full. Don't you think that's a pretty strong term? Compel them to come in. Perhaps Spurgeon, another great preacher from London in the 19th century, said it best. If sinners would be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. And let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. James 5 verse 20 says, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. That's what we need to do. We need to be looking out for the lost sheep, our Jesus. Dr. Pearson, he was a pastor in America and at Spurgeon's Tabernacle in London. He wrote this, there is a secret fellowship with God where we get this heavenly fire kindled within. And it makes personal work for souls easy, natural, a relief, and a rest. To linger in God's presence until we see souls as through his eyes makes us long over them with a tireless longing. And he continues to say, this passion for souls is probably the highest product of spiritual communion with God. It absorbs us. And even our own salvation is forgotten in that passionate yearning, which made Moses ready to have his name blotted out of God's book for Israel's sake. Or Paul willing to be anathema that's cursed for the sake of his brethren. It seems to me that such passion is the highest form of unselfish love and the nearest approximation to the divine motive that impelled the Lord Jesus Christ to empty himself of his original glory and majesty and assume the form of a servant, enduring even the cross. No man can kindle in himself that celestial fire. It must come from the live coal from the altar above. Here's a picture of John Harper. He was a Baptist pastor who started preaching at the age of 18. 1897, he was the first pastor of the Paisley Road Baptist Church in Glasgow, Scotland. Under his care, the church quickly grew from 25 members to over 500. And you're all familiar with the Titanic disaster. Well, he was on board the Titanic. He was 39 at that uh, stage. He was a widower. He had a six-year-old daughter. He was on his way to, uh, to America, as I recall, to actually preach at the, uh, the Moody Church. Yes, that's it. Traveling with his daughter and sister to Chicago uh, when the ship hit an iceberg. His daughter and sister were put on a lifeboat and survived, but Harper stayed behind and jumped into the water as the ship began to sink. Some who survived told that Harper preached the gospel to the end, especially Act 1631, first aboard the sinking ship and then afterwards to those in the freezing water before dying in it himself. This man, as he was dying, would be preaching on the Titanic. Dr. William B. Riley relates the story of John Harper. When the Titanic was struck by the iceberg that drove in her sides and sent the ship to the bottom, John Harper was leaning against the rail, pleading with a young man to come to Christ. Four years after the Titanic went down, a young Scotsman arose in a meeting in Hamilton, Canada, and said, I'm a survivor of the Titanic. When I was drifting alone on a piece of wood that awful night, the tide brought to me Mr. John Harper of Glasgow, also on a piece of wreckage. 
Man, he called to me, are you saved? No, I said, I'm not. He cried again, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And the young man standing said the waves bore him away. But strange to say, in a few moments brought him back. And again he called, are you saved now? No, I said, I cannot say I am. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The young man said shortly after that, he went down. And there, alone in the night, with two miles of water under me, I believed. And I am John Harper's last convert. This man who had such a passion for souls that he would preach, even when he knew he was facing his death. And so in closing, I want to ask, do you love Jesus? And if you say yes, and hopefully that's your response, when Jesus asked Peter that, he said, Lord, you know I do. Jesus asked him three times, you know I do. And so I ask you, do you love Jesus? And I expect your response is, yes, of course I do. Well, you want to know how you can show your love? Jesus told Peter, when he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me three times? And Peter said, you know I do. You know all things. You know that I love you. He said, feed my sheep. Okay, Jesus loves his sheep. He told us to feed his sheep, and that includes the lost sheep. Remember the parable? The lost sheep, we need to remember them. Jesus loved the sheep. And he says to Peter, you want to prove that you love me? Feed my sheep. Love Jesus' sheep the same way that he did. Amen.